Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for an on the record discussion on one of the most important topics on the world agenda on one of the most important days on the United Nations calendar, World Food Day. I am John Mancure, Director for Latin America and the Caribbean at the Financial Times, and we have a great panel for you, which will be moderated by my colleague, Brian Harris, Brazil Bureau Chief. I would like to thank JBS for making this discussion possible and partner FGV Projetos Europe for their support and organization of this event. On behalf of JBS, FGV Projetos Europe, and the Financial Times, thank you again for joining us. Before we begin, a small disclaimer. All statements expressed by Fundasal Jutulio Vargas employees and guests in our online events and broadcasts exclusively represent their opinions right, and not necessarily right. FGV's institutional position. We also reiterate that everyone present here agreed to participate in this event of their own free will and they consented to be recorded in this broadcast, which will, <clears throat> excuse me, which will be later on FGV's official channels. <clears throat> I am now pleased to introduce good friend and director at FGV Projectos Europe, Cesar Campos. Cesar, please. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I, I want to welcome everyone and to thank the invitation to, to be part of this uh, web seminar. I'd like to also thank Mr. Gilberto Tomazzoni, JBS Global CEO, and Luis Carlos Duque, my colleague at FGV Projetos, John Mancuri, Alexander, our good friends. And I, I extend also all my thank you to Leslie, Pia, and Brian. Uh, I, I have only a short presentation, but I have to read some statements so in order to tease you to start our discussion. Uh, I think this event could not be more timely. Uh, after the Nobel Peace Award 2020, given to the World Food Program, there is no doubt about the role of food as driving force to ensure peace and prevent the use of hunger as a weapon of war and conflicts. And this, uh, Roberto Rodriguez, our leader in the FGV, is always saying the same uh, quote. They remark that food security, peace, and stability go together. I could not agree more. But the challenge is how to produce food on a large scale to guarantee the food security of the world increasing population. Increasing is a very important uh, matter in this uh, sentence. Why maintain environmental sustainability? It's a really a big challenge. The answer is not easy, but research and technology are central issues. Brazil is doing its job as a lead investor in, in agricultural research in Latin America. Only between 2003 and 2016, there was an increase of 46% in expenses in research and development in the sector. So it's not a uh, uh, short money, it's a good and good money invest. As a result, in the last 30 years, Brazil has grown its production 74% and its productivity has increased more 300%. So we need less land to produce more. Actually, Brazil is the third largest food producer in the world, behind only the United States and Europe. This means that much of the world's food security is related to Brazilian capacity to produce grains, oil seeds, and animals. It's a big responsibility. Unfortunately, for some months, Brazil's image has been deteriorating abroad, especially in Europe, due to, due to the news about increased illegal deforestation in the Amazon. I have to remark that the European market represents 70% of our, our agribusiness destination. So we have to take care about this issue, not only because of the, the, the market, but also for, because of the environmental issues. The subject of environmental preservation has been gaining increasing relevance worldwide, especially among the youth, and which is a good guarantee that we remain for many decades under observation. A few days ago, European supermarket chain has informed that they could eventually boycott imports of Brazilian products originating in unlawful deforested area, areas. Therefore, we have a problem to face and it needs to be combated with invisible speed and rigor, or the boycott could in fact harm Brazilian export and Brazilian capacity to feed the world. 
And even worse, there is already explicit resistance from some European political sectors to the implementation of our uh, European Mercosur agreement, which is really necessary for the increase in trade and investment between the two blocs. There is a real risk. We need to stop this event from happening. No more illegality in the Amazon or in any other regions, neither deforestation, nor fire, nor invasion of land. Brazil needs to have a vigorous international campaign to show our good reality, not giving anyone the argument to boycott any Brazilian product in any market. Brazil needs to continue to feed the world. I'm sorry to tease you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention and good discussion. Brian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cesar, and good morning, one and all from Brazil. Uh, it's really a distinct honor to be moderating this panel with such a selection of esteemed guests today. It's actually my first time moderating a virtual panel, so I'm curious how the discussion will flow. Anyway, in any case, I hope we have an open discussion, a conversation, and maybe even a bit of debate uh, in parts. I've been here in Brazil for 18 months, and most of that time has actually been focused on the, the nitty gritty of Brazilian politics and economics. Uh, when I first got here in Sao Paulo, pension reform was the talk of the town. Then it moved on to tax reform, administrative reform. Anyone who lives here will know that under President Bolsonaro, there is rarely a dull moment, especially for journalists. However, in recent months, the focus of the FT agenda here in Brazil has shifted and has shifted to sustainability. Sustainability in food, sustainability in farming, and sustainability of our environment, including the Amazon rainforest and Brazil's other threatened biomes. I had a good chance to speak on this topic with executives from JBS recently. And actually in December, the FT will have a special report on this very topic coming out with a heavy focus on food and food production. Where is all this coming from? All of this is coming from some fairly stark realities climate change, climate catastrophe, and growing population. By 2050, we know the world's population will be 10 billion people. Feeding that number of people will require significant increases in the amount of food produced, and will that be proteins, grains, or other foodstuffs. To discuss how we can do this, and how we can do it in a sustainable way, we have an eminent panel of speakers today. You've already heard from Cesar and FJV, and I'm honored to introduce Gilberto Tomazzoni, CEO of JBS, the world's largest meat packing company. Pierre Ederer, Program and Science Director of the Global Food and Agribusiness Network. And last but not least, Dr. Leslie Mitchell, Associate Director for Sustainable Nutrition at the Forum for the Future. I'm hoping we can have an open and lively discussion today, and I would encourage some debates among our panelists. But please do wait until the speaker has finished before you interject. Gilberto, let's start with you. Today is, okay. World, food. Today is World Food Day, and you run the world's largest meat company. What do you see as your company's role in feeding the world? And how can JBS increase production in a sustainable manner? Uh, Brian, if you don't mind, I want to, to say first, good morning, everyone. It is a, it's an honor to be with you in, in the World Food Day, uh, which marks the 75th anniversary of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. And I would like to thank the princes of our debaters, uh, Piers Eder, Leslie Mitchell, Cesar Campos, and our host, FGV Europe, and, and you, Brian, from the Financial Times, our immediate partners. Uh, today, we collectively face one of the humanity's greatest challenge. How can we create a sustainable food system then can feed a growing world. GBS is committed to help society meet this challenge, and we are excited about the future we will build together. Since 2014, the world has experienced successively increased the number of those suffering from malnutrition. We have seen economic improvements in emerging markets, whose dietary habits have improved, but 699 million people still go hungry. In 2050, according to the United Nations forecast, the global population will be reached 10 billion, as you mentioned before. And while we produce enough food to feed the world today, our food system is not efficient enough to provide affordable, safe, and nutrition food to everyone. Our challenge to feed in the world will only become greater in the future. Unfortunately, 
uh, our population uh, and the global demand for food will increase and will need to meet the increased demand without additional natural research. We, have, we only have one planet and a finite set of natural resources for food production. There is no magic solution for this dilemma. The only way to meet this challenge is to embrace more efficient production and harness innovation to produce more with less. As a member of the private sector, we be aware of our important role in this endeavor, but we also believe in joint force and learning from our peers and experts and how to, be, how to best address this challenge. And that is why we are here today. The balance of equation of the needs for increasing productivity and the preservation of nature. It's imperative that broader range of sector of global economy come together. And we, for example, we are permanently invest in research and develop the product and, and process. But we have also joined force with our farmers, partners and suppliers to increase the productivity and quality of what we can offer to the consumers. We have several virtual expansions that are driving to push us ahead. The livestock farming, as mentioned before, for example, are working together with beef cattle producers to increase production while using a smaller area of pasture. Brazil has achieved good result in this matter. Between 1990 and 2019, meat production uh, per actor practically tripled. Our suppliers are producing more using less land. In several cases, we have financial management consultants to assist in this process to uh, intensify farm pasture. That not only increase productivity, but also help to reduce greenhouse in gas emission in the livestock farming chain. We have created a blockchain, we have created a blockchain platform to monitor not only our direct supplier, but our indirect supplier as well. While we provide the support for, our, for the sustainable development of the industry in order to protect the Amazon. Technology has enabled a giant step forward in food uh, production process. Farm 4.0 now fosters social development in farming, which is fundamental for combating hunger. We have invested in transforming our conventional chicken house into automated ones. This increased productivity and efficiency. And we have also promoted the use of solar energy in logistical projects, sharing the gain in competitiveness. Another fundamental issue in this global dilemma is the reduction of waste with maximum utilization of the raw material. Industry in general has made an important effort in this matter. Over 1 million tons of waste generation by our operation around the world were reused in 2019, of which 121 tons, thousand tons went to generation of energy. Globally, we recycle 50% of post-processing waste. In 2019 alone, we produced 265 million liters of biodiesel based on leftover cooking oil and remaining of the law, uh, of raw material in our plant Brazil, where are using the renewable energy in our sorry in our uh, operation in Brazil. We the renewable energy accounts for 90 percent of the total consumption of our production units. In 2019. We managed 23.9 tons of solid waste through our recycled business. We produce recycled plastic product, products such as garbage bags, protective pellets, uh, covers, and plastic resin. We have also developed a new products from the recycled plastic to be used in, by JBS business, such as canvas and plastic pallets for lining our trucks. We are we are strong believers in encouraging innovation in order to attain new level of food production worldwide to make this increasingly accessible. In Thank 2009, in 2009, you. sorry. 
Thank you, Gilberto. That is that's wonderful. Do you have anything we can wrap up on that point? No, sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, that, that is very wonderful. That's very interesting. I would like to just switch to Pierre and I have a question on, okay. on technology and innovation, which, which you referenced. Uh, Pierre, in the past, you have said the question of how do we feed 10, 10 billion people is easy, but the answer is very, very hard. Why exactly is it so complicated? And what do you see as the ideal solution? Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this panel, and uh, I, I want to uh, repeat what my previous, uh, uh, what the previous speaker said. Uh, this discussion comes at the at the most timeliest moment, uh, the the Peace Nobel Prize, the World Food Day. We will we will be spending hopefully the next years discussing this topic uh, because if we don't solve this issue of how we can transform our global food system towards a sustainable basis, feeding reliably every person three, three meals per day, we will not be able to solve any other challenge that we have in the world, whether that's civil war, that's climate change, migration, you name it. We will not be able to fix any other of our issues unless we get to the point where we can serve reliably a nutritious meal three times a day to every person on the planet. Now, why is that so difficult? The global food system is easily, is easily the most complex and largest industry in the world. There is not another industry that comes even close to delivering 20 billion final products, because that's what we do. We deliver 20 billion meals each day to our, our customers. And there is not a single other industry anywhere in the world that is so interconnected and that has to live under this just-in-time delivery command of putting three meals a day on everybody's person, every person's pl uh, plate uh, each day. So, so it's incredibly complex. And unfortunately, many of the, of the answers or many of the proposals that are being squirreled around they are just simply too simplistic. They're, they're, they're just not recognizing the degree of complexity that, that we need to deal with in this industry. Now, um, Gilberto already said it, Caesar already said, and I can only, uh, I can only blow into that same uh, horn. The answer is we are facing a shortage of willingness and ability to deploy technology. We, we need to deploy more technology to increase efficiency of productivity. And with that, I don't only mean those technologies that are in the pipeline. It would already be a great ability if we could only use those technologies that we have already today and put them into place. But there is a shortage of willingness and ability to deploy all the technologies. What we're not sure of, we're not short of natural resources. We have enough agricultural land, we have enough water, we actually have enough atmospheric resources. If we were only using the land and the water and the atmospheric resources as efficiently as we knew how to do, we could easily feed everybody that we need to do now and in 30 years but we need to do it as efficiently as we can. That is where we need to focus. We're not short of resources, we're short of technology and willingness to deploy technology. Here, this shortage of willingness, where is it most evident? Well, it is most evident in Africa and in South and Asia. That is where we have the lowest productivities and that is where we have the, the, the lowest, um, let me say, probably political willingness to provide the conditions for the farming and the fishing communities to, to make the, to create the enabling environments to, to deploy technologies. And I hear, uh, I, I, I believe Brazil has a, a fundamental role to play, not just minding its own fantastic natural resources and, and creating food, as was pointed out, but also to, to help 
those places in Africa and Southern Asia with technologies that are being developed and, and, and methods that are known in Brazil, how to, how to uh, make more productive, more efficient use of the natural resources that are available. Do you think it could be a lack of resources or capacity or even financing? Well, financing, uh, finance always follows, uh, fi financing is never a shortage. Financing follows wherever there is opportunity. Um, but because the industry is so complex, you need a lot of factors to come together. You need, you need companies, you need uh, solid property rights, you need enabling political environments, you need access to trade flows and so on and so forth. A lot of enabling factors, social and economic factors need to come together so that, so that technology can be deployed. So I don't think finance is the restricting, uh, is, is the restriction, it's, it's, the, it's, it's making sure that all the enabling factors are always in place. Uh, and uh, so, so that the farmers and the fishers have the ability and the interest to invest in, in better methods, better technologies. Leslie, despite massive increases in productivity and production, world hunger has been on the rise since 2014. That's according to the UN. What is causing this and what can be done to solve that? I think the first point that you hear from, from both of our previous speakers really brings to light the fact that this is a system. This is a deeply, deeply complex system. Um, and the first question I would ask of that food system is, is well, what are the goals? that it's trying to achieve, because clearly it's not trying to achieve the resolution of world hunger. Um, and if we look into the food system, what is driving it primarily? Looking at productivity, looking at efficiency, looking at short-term gain. And it's primarily based around those key successes of the Green Revolution, which were around often extractive ways of production, but that would lead to those key areas of productivity and yield. So we've been pushing down that, that, that walkway for, for decades now. But it still isn't achieving the results that we are hoping to achieve. And some of that will be around exactly, as you say, Pia, those, those enabling conditions. But I think we have to start looking again at what are the goals of that food system and what are they genuinely trying to achieve? Now, we have global goals with the, the SDGs that are well underway we're five years into that process now, and the 2020s are supposed to be the decade of delivery. And we know we have deep challenges and urgencies around climate change that if we do not solve in the next 10 years, we will be into runaway climate change and into deep challenges in terms of climatic events. So climate resilience becomes a key goal of any food system. But food systems to enable the security that we've talked about now need to be equitable and need to provide sound, resilient, solid livelihoods for those who are producing them if we want to ensure security. So we're now in a place where we are at a point of a left turn, a fork in the road, and we have to choose which direction we go forward. And my argument would be at this point that business as usual cannot be the solution to the future. And we actually need to look at ways that are going to restore our natural resources. And as you say, make the best of what we have within our food systems, but maybe do it in new and innovative in sometimes very old ways. So one of the key areas, for example, where I can see incredible wins for Brazil, but also for Africa, as you say, um, for Southeast Asia, is around looking at regenerative practices that put those goals of environmental sustainability, restoration, climate resilience, animal welfare, livelihoods and productivity together to look for those win-wins. So many of you won't know who I, I am. My, I'm, my name is Leslie Mitchell. I work for Forum for the Future, um, but my background uh, for decades has been in working in sustainable livestock. And I have seen the challenges that, for example, Amazonian cattle ranchers have faced in, in countries, particularly I worked in Colombia, um, where they have taken those challenges of being seen as the, you know, the, the devils of red meat and climate change, but are now working with new practices such as silvopastoral farming that can deliver productivity, deliver climate resilience, 
deliver good livelihoods, deliver productivity in ways that meet all the things that consumers would want. And yet they're not doing this with new pesticides or new nanotechnologies. They're doing this with understanding the way that those practices of managing the land can achieve that change. And so my inspiration when I came to Latin America for the very first time was to see cattle ranchers doing this. We know we have a big challenge in terms of looking at the wider food system and how much protein we have available, how we may need to rebalance diets, perhaps towards more plant forward protein in certain regions. But we know that both meat and plant are part of that picture. And we know that there are solutions, but it has to be based around those goals. And the challenge for me is whether businesses will act only when they see that they're going to be delisted because of their ESG position or whether they will proactively embed that in their business strategies and advocate for that enabling environment that will meet those challenges. And that's where I see whether it be one of the biggest meat producers of the world or Brazil or those new countries where we have emerging markets and the big challenges of population growth, there is huge potential. If we don't do that, that will be why we end up with growing and growing and growing hunger. Thank you very much, Leslie. You've touched on a number of very interesting themes, which I hope we can return to uh, very shortly. I'd just like but to take Gary, a Brian, oh, Gilberto, uh, I shall re re return no, to you no, very I, shortly. I, I just, sorry to interrupt you, but what uh, I totally agree with Leslie. Uh, I want more than happy to, to, show you, to show to you, Leslie, Leslie, a project that we just launched in Brazil in the uh, few weeks ago. It's about Amazon. Is the focus on develop the Amazon, restoring the forest the one side. The other is develop the, the local economy and uh, the people that live there, good practice in investing in, 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 uh, in uh, technology in, in uh, research there. I think is, I totally agree, we need to develop there. We have a huge ca capacity so, to produce, but I'm we don't devastate anything. I'm about to uh, return to that, Gilberto, in just a moment. For, first, I just want to step back a bit and give Cesar the floor. Cesar, I'd like to talk more broadly about the private sector. I mean, what do you think is its role in providing food security to the world? And do you think the world's big producers are moving quick enough to a business model that has sustainability at its core? Cesar? Uh, Cesar, unmute. Uh, yeah, I mute. Yeah, well, uh, I, I totally agree that the, the Brazilian companies, private companies, are the, the the biggest companies in the world. They have to help to to give more sustainability in the farm uh, or social or everything that is related to the food production. Uh, the problem is, uh, uh, is is a huge amount of money in order to to do this. And they are investing in technology. They are investing in raw material. They are investing in everything. So I, I also like to, to, to tell Pia that uh, FGV is doing a project in Senegal and Nigeria. We did it there already in Haiti, uh, bringing our Brazilian technology to the, those countries. And we, we have to have also the problem of social economic uh, for the local people. But uh, the image of Brazil is not good enough nowadays. So I think it is, the private sector can help uh, doing this kind of a discussion because we do a lot of good things, more good things than bad things, but we always uh, listen in the newspaper or in other papers that uh, everything is bad in Brazil. It's not, it's in contrary. So I think the private sector has a role to, to, to do the, in this matter. Thank you very much, Cesar. And Gilberto, we can now return to you and, and let's drill down on the topic of the hour. Meat packers have historically faced a lot of criticism. One, for the role of cows in emissions, and two, in the case of Brazil, for the connection between cattle ranching and deforestation, particularly in the Amazon rainforest. What is JBS doing to improve performance in both regards? And can you offer assurances your supply chain can be cleared of cows raised from deforested lands? Uh, we we launch, uh, we launch an, um, uh, a plan for uh, to Amazon now. We focus on Amazon. This, 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 um, 
this project, this program, they have two, uh, uh, four pillars, but two parts. One, one part is one pillar is to take care of our value chain because we are responsible for our value chain. We need to, we need to, to be sure that our value chain is not cause deforestation in the, in the forest. This is one thing. So far, we are monitoring about uh, 400 million uh, hectares in Amazon, but just for our direct suppliers. 100% we can guarantee our direct supplier we have no deforestation, but so far, we didn't have technology to go ahead, to go to the suppliers of the, our suppliers. Now we have the technology. Now we go ahead. We are monitor, monitor all of the value chain. This is a one, this is, it is what's now, because now technology help us. The blockchain technology support this. Transparency and, and, uh, and uh, you are sure that this, uh, you are confident to put in the, your data there. But you need to collaboration. We can do alone. We need to collaboration, and it's not it's not something to put the, the people out of the, the out of the value chain. Because if we put out of our program, the people still produce uh, carol. They still are devastated. And then we have a program to educate and to support with the financial with money and information that be that put the guys inside of our policy. Then in terms of increased productivity, or if they have problem with the uh, with fiduciary problem with the, with the, 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 the land, or if they have other problems, we are supporting the guy to be entering the legal system. So we are put there. Sure. The other part, but it's, it is, it is uh, related to the uh, communities that live there. Because I know to take off our part is important. We are doing that, take our part. But I think it's, Companies is a is a is a social part of the society. We need to do we need to do more than just to take care of our 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 part. And because of that, we created the fund of Amazon. And this we are we are our we aim to have one billion reais for this fund. We and uh, and two five hundred million reais for each one. The other part, donation, we are put one real. But uh, then we, we can reach five million reais in our donation, but depends of the other. But independent of that, we guarantee for the fund 250 million reais uh, for the fund. We st already start, we put a team to, to work there. We invite many of people to be joined us to define what is the most important project to invest there. Uh, mm -hmm. And we are already someone that other part, we are invited third party to join us for this effort. Because we, we, we strongly believe that we need to, to develop the communities that live there. Uh, the value of the, 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 the tree should be higher when they are, they are, they are standard, not in the, in the land. No? Then we need to, to teach and need to develop. And the other part, we need to invest in research and development, I think is, I strongly believe there is a new molecule to be discovered there. We could be had this challenge to feed the world, uh, uh, put money on that. And this, this is what we are doing to, 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 to develop the Amazon. I think is one is community, the other is restoring the forest, the other is investing in technology and research. Thank you, Gilberto. I think you touched on a, a very, I would say, the crucial point, which is a lot of what's happening in the Amazon today is, is driven by poverty and a lack of resources. So you have to provide opportunities for people in those communities to, to prevent them engaging in, in illegal behavior. Um, Pierre, Gilberto spoke about technology R&D, and we've heard about uh, JBS efforts in terms of blockchain. To your mind, what technologies should the world be focusing on more closely? Well, there, there is a whole range of technologies, uh, and, and I think uh, we always need to keep in, in mind that it's not just the technology, but the technology plus the business method. So you need to, you need to marry the technology with the business model. Um, 
But the one that, that uh, Gilberto has, has already pointed out and that JBS is currently uh, spearheading in a very valuable effort is a data science. So, so the costs and the availability of sensors on the one hand, uh, sensors being on the animal, sensors of what's happening in the soil, cameras watching from, from space and so on and so forth, uh, that that's the 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 cost of collecting information on what is going on on the ground has become so low and the cost of processing all that data has also become so low um, to to generate meaningful insights that we are now at a point or or you know over the next very few years so two three four years at the moment at the maximum that we're able to to monitor complete value chains all the way back to their original source. And if we can monitor complete value chains from the, from the uh, till in the, in, the retail, in the retail zone in Europe, all the way back to, to, the, to the plot of land somewhere in Brazil or somewhere in Congo or somewhere in, in, in Indonesia, wherever, if we can monitor that complete value chain, that means that we can then guarantee legality and, and, and ethical, uh, ethical, properly ethical behavior. And that monitoring is central to ensure that the legal frameworks and the ethical frameworks that we demand of the, of the food system is being, is being kept, is being maintained. So I would say over the very soon, I would say latest by the year 2025, there is no excuse anymore for any private sector company that they cannot guarantee legality and ethical behavior of the value chain. If they haven't done their homework over the next couple of years and cannot guarantee, make a solid guarantee of that, then they have not used the right technologies. That's one area of technology I can talk about more. I think there is lots of promise in genetic improvements, both mm -hmm. in plant and in animals. Um, and there is we, we're growing capacity and understanding what goes on in soils. Uh, mm -hmm. Leslie mentioned the, the tremendous power of regenerative practices. Uh, there's, there's lots to explore, lots to deploy, lots of methods to use. Uh, mm -hmm. Regeneration is, is a, a regenerative agriculture is a tremendous area of improvement and where I personally be believe that agriculture will turn up to become the major solution rather than being a problem to many of our global resource issues, whether that's climate or deforestation or water shortages. We will discover that agriculture will be a solution, not the problem. Mm -hmm. When we talk about food, nutrition is often left out of the discussion. Feeding the world is one thing, but we also want to be able to offer food that is nutritious as well as economically priced. Leslie, to your mind, what is the state of global nutrition now? And as we increase food production, what aspects should we be thinking about? So I think, um, again, this come back, comes back to goals. And I think many of these solutions are actually more simple than we think they are, but the deployment of them is often the complex point or the willingness to create an enabling environment for them to happen. So if you think about access to protein, there's, there's a huge dynamism in, in the protein market now. Um, so we have many more options, for example, in the West, different ways of, of accessing one of the most key components of our living being. They're looking at new and innovative plant forward capital, for example. Now this has got really noisy from the point of view of venture, venture capital driving that, that space. Mm -hmm. um, but I think actually many of those solutions are much simpler and maybe much more appropriate in terms of nutrition, in terms of whole food based diets um, and what is going to be acceptable culturally in different environments like Southeast Asia, for example. I think there's a different piece as well around the role of livestock. And this comes back to a core question of how do you enable access to micronutrients? So there's a lot of attention these days, for example, in the one egg a day, um, the small scale dairy production, the role of beef, for example, as needing, for example, if you have less but better beef, um, the potential for that to provide in very short order, 
a huge amount of micronutrients. So I think we have to look at all of these, these pieces as a bigger picture of how do you enable people in a context specific state in a particular region, in a particular food culture to access the right knowledge, skills, resources, and, and so on, to be able to produce the appropriate food. And that isn't necessarily going to be solved by industrial giants. That may be solved by creating the right commercial small scale markets for smallholders to be able to access that market and to be able to share product. The, um, the biggest point I think within this conversation that I would really want to draw to bear because it gets very noisy are some of the key messages that we see now, but where they're going in future around the food system. So um, I think Gilberto and both pair, you, you mentioned the issue of the younger generations coming forward. And we see a huge focus on provenance from them. We see a huge focus on provenance in any middle class around the world that is growing, a real intelligence around where food is coming from. And that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone is going to move to vegetarian or vegan diets, but there is a huge interest in the impact of those diets in the world. Um, so I think we need to look at both production and consumption. So how can you produce the right foods that will deliver sustainable, nutritious, healthy diets for all within the appropriate context. Um, and that is the challenge that, that will face us moving forward. Um, it is complex, but it's not insoluble. We have just done a piece of work very briefly looking at what it would take to shift the North American agricultural system towards more regenerative practices. And the interesting thing there was the question about how do you achieve good nutrition and good healthy diets from sustainable farming was a question not about how do how do farmers farm it was a question about do you have the right policies do you have the right routes to market do you have the right market incentives is the patient capital there to enable that to happen and that is the role of business in this and policymakers and businesses as advocates to enable that shift towards a food system that delivers on those goals and i say again on world food day sitting here with an audience from and, a, and participants from Brazil and from one of the largest food companies in the world. You could be, as you were saying, says our demons, or you could be the ultimate solution to that, that challenge. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, we've mentioned plant-based alternatives to meat and Gilberto, I would just like to get your, your vision and your impression of this in terms of, of production and also you know, viability in terms of profits. How viable are these products? And what are the main obstacles to rolling them out more broadly in the coming years? Brian, uh, let me to, to, to uh, I think is the it's a good question, but we have opportunity inside of our existing uh, value chain. For example, we in 2019, we established uh, a global food innovation center in the Colorado State University, inside the University of Missouri. Why? For developer research into the products, food science, and safety, animal welfare is one of the kind of innovation center that will be the forefront from the future of food and the sustainable production. This is one. The alternative proteins, as you, as, as you mentioned, uh, will also uh, help us to address this global, global food demand in a sustainable way. Uh, we have a, a created a three plant-based brands around the globe. And one of them is, a, is already a market leader. Uh, I think is the global challenge for a dedicated the hunger is, uh, is taking now a new, a new dimension with the COVID-19. Uh, we don't mention now, but I think it's a new dimension. Innovation, environment, and social responsibility are now more necessary than ever. Uh, the, this, the pandemic has presented a challenge for, uh, for which many people were most not prepared for then. But one million of our global citizens have lost their life to COVID. People have left ever lost their job and hunger has increased. Uh, 
JBAD believed that COMP must be act as agent, uh, agent of social transformation and during this crisis, invest in their communities. I strongly believe that company will not prosper, will this community suffer? Uh, and uh, we have donated 700 million reais during this pandemic, building a hospital in Brazil, donation millions of tons of foods around the world, 50,000 items of hospital equipment, 89 ambulances, engine kinds, uh, kits, masks, gloves, and invest in the millions of local communities. And, uh, and, uh, and today, today is the World Food Day. And we are renew our hope with a new solidarity effort. We are mobilizing volunteers and NGOs who by next Friday will have organized and distributed 120,000 meals benefiting vulnerable mm. families and six Brazilian states. This is an extension of the $120 million committed that we assume uh, at the offset of the pandemic. And Thank you, uh, Thank you Gilberto. Leslie, sorry, just to return to plant-based alternatives and alternative proteins. I mean, there's a lot of talk about the chemicals used in, in the manufacturing process and, and even whether these, these um, alternative proteins are healthy. W what is your take on this subject? I think it's a really good question. I'm, I'm no fan of ultra processed foods. Um, I think we have many more solutions um, than the, the very uh, you know, processed new uh, modern plant-based proteins that are out there. Um, I think they, however, if we're looking at building solutions that deliver uh, certain areas of nutrition, such as protein, um, and um, have a light touch on the planet, it's an area of significant um, opportunity. I think the challenge comes when you're trying to uh, replicate processed foods with other processed foods. Um, it's probably not the answer to world, world hunger. Um, and I do think that there is much more to be had around understanding food cultures and how you know, many of these solutions already exist. Um, I grew up poor and I, I know how to live on, on a, you know, on a working credit diet uh, when I was a teenager in the UK and I and that's just a simple very you know first world answer to to those challenges people have these solutions so um, you know whether it be around um, building uh, you know the supply of legumes for example um, uh, access to good quality grains access to many more uh, plants um, that they can use within diets, that people can have access to within diets. The issue is not about food poverty. The issue is often about poverty um, and lack of access to good quality food. And, and that's a different challenge um, to, to what we should be eating in terms of what kinds of proteins, for example. I guess one thing that is driving the plant protein space um, is the issue of greenhouse gas emissions, is the issue of environmental impact. And I think when we come back to looking at the core questions that are sitting around this conversation, um, I think what you will find is, is that th that drive will not stop if we do not protect the environments that are key to our survival, whether we're talking about the Amazon, the Cerrado, the wetlands, um, mm -hmm. if we're talking about how we produce animals um, animal welfare is a massive issue. So you have the yeah. business benchmark for farm animal welfare that is looking at the animal animal welfare practices mm -hmm. of the same large companies and FAIR, for example, and others which are around investor measures um, that address this issue, core issue of what kinds of proteins are going to be fit for the future. So it's a bigger question than what nutrition is in them. I think there's a big question about where do plant proteins fit in that wider system what are they and how do we create a better food system? Um, would anyone care to respond to Dr. Mitchell? Anyone? Yeah, um, I, I, I'd like to second uh, Leslie and, and actually probably make it uh, accentuate that even more. We're, we're diverting a lot of resource and creativity and, and capital to, uh, to technologies that 
potentially will in 10, maybe even, even in 20 years be competitive. Um, while we have problems here and now today, uh, like Leslie mentioned, it would be great if we could, if we could provide you know, an egg a day per family everywhere in the world. Um, and, and creating plant-based proteins is not going to deliver that over the next 10 years. So, so um, uh, the, these plant-based proteins, they are a little bit of a, of a toy for, for rich world urbanites, uh, their, their lifestyle choices, uh, but, but they really do not attack core issues, core problems that we have in, in, uh, among the global food system of today. And those problems of today, they will accompany us for the next 10, 20 years. So the solutions to deliver a, a nutritious and sustainable meal to everybody on the planet for the next 10 to 20 years is going to be in livestock. Livestock knows how to convert plants and, and, and in, into, into nutritious meals. So that's where we need to focus. And, and uh, we, we know how to do that. Uh, we, we need to create the socioeconomic conditions and, and again, on the greenhouse gas emissions, uh, I, I strongly believe that the, the regeneration knowledge that we're gaining now in, in terms of carbon sequestration will, will show us uh, very quickly, and the accounting is actually quite optimistic, that if, if we do a, a, a true honest accounting of greenhouse gas emissions with, with modern regenerative science that we have, then we will also find out that livestock is actually uh, not carbon positive, but actually carbon negative. In other words, livestock can actually sequester carbon from the atmosphere back into the soils where it belongs. So, so uh, livestock is the answer, really. It's, it's, it's the answer for the next 10 to 20 years, for sure. Beyond that, well, let's see, but for, for sure for the next 10 to 20 years, livestock is the answer. We only have about five minutes left, so I'd like us to wrap up by taking stock of the biggest challenges facing humanity, that is the increasing destruction wrought by global warming and the ongoing ravages of the coronavirus, both of which pose big challenges to food production and security. Let's start with global warming. Fires this year have raged all around the world. Climates are getting hotter and drier. How can food producers protect themselves and their customers from these risks? Cesar, would you like to comment? Cesar? Sorry, yeah, sorry, sorry. So, so you were asking about the, the, the climate change and the effect how, of the... How can food producers protect themselves and their customers from the risks of climate change? Yeah, to, to protect the, 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 the climate, to protect the land, to protect the, yeah. the areas. Exactly. But the problem, yeah, the, the, the problem is that to, to invest in technology, to invest in research and training and also to be care of social issues in, in the big countries like Brazil or Africa or some, some, some places that they don't have anything. And uh, as uh, Pia said at the beginning, we have a, a very complex system in order to produce food. It's not only to grow in your land, but you have to transport, you have to, to, to buy machinery, you have to have special food that it can keep in in any place and so it's a very complex uh, system but uh, if you use the right technology the night knowledge you can uh, keep the unsafe the environment uh, problem that we have uh, nowadays and i think brazil is doing that but there's a lot of effort, efforts and a lot of money involved thank you cesar uh, coronavirus too has posed problems for supply chains, um, but obviously the main issue was the direct hit to citizens around the world, uh, their lack of income and rising hunger. Uh, Gilberto, just to sum things up, um, answering on the topic of coronavirus, how can we make sure people around the world are fed during this very difficult time? So, sorry, my, could you repeat the question? I was not... How can we make sure citizens around the world are fed given the context of global pandemic? Sorry, I, 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 I have, I have, I'm, I, I, can, I don't know if it's, the sound is not good. I cannot understand. 
could you repeat again? Sorry for that. No problem at all. Uh, the coronavirus has obviously posed big problems for supply chains, but exactly. also for food supply, for people getting access to food. Given the difficult circumstances, the global pandemic, how can we make sure that people around the world are fed? This is a, this is a, a, a great question. And, uh, and I strongly believe that uh, it is the answer for that question and for other questions is to join efforts. We cannot, this is, 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 is not something that one company or can, one company, one sector can, uh, can solve alone. We need to, we strongly believe that the private sector need to, 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 to join all of the efforts to the society with the governments, the other institutions, NGOs, the other institutions, and find the best solution for to fed the world. I, because the, uh, we have technology, we know how to do, we know how to produce, you know, but you know, we face many of the challenge, this process uh, could be political challenge, could be other reason. And if you join all of them, if you focus on, on, to, on to solve the problem of, uh, uh, of uh, malnutrition, because one thing is malnutrition, the, the, the other thing is, uh, is uh, hungry. Uh, 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 we, I, I, uh, we are so strong believe that if you join force, we are find the solutions because technology are available and, uh, and we need to focus on and the responsibility of the company is not to deliver just the result of the quarter, is to be the sustainable result for the future because we are part of the society. And we, used to, and we are focused. For me, the solution, we need to join efforts. Wonderful. On that positive note, I would like to thank you all for participating and wrap up this panel. It's been absolutely fascinating and I appreciate all your contributions and um, many thanks to you all. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.